Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Alamo Draft House Weird Wednesday presentation of Girls from Thunder Strip. This is a very, very special evening because we have uh, one of the stars of the film, Gary Kent, is here tonight. And, uh, Woo -hoo! Yes. Uh, and he's kind of had this sort of weird parallel track in his career where he was in some pretty well-made films by Peter Bogdanovich and Richard Rush and many others. I uh, was a well-known, uh, also well-known stuntman, well-known special effects man. I uh, did a lot of great work uh, along the pictures that really have become immortal. Uh, and then also, in the parallel time, he did all these non-union grade Z movies, of which tonight is definitely one of them, uh, where he would frequently play thug number one, or rapist number one, or rapist biker number one. But he is, however, probably I would say top five nicest people I've ever met. So it's always really stunning. <laughs> yes. And if you know Gary, you know this. It's always really stunning to see Gary do something like, in this movie, five minutes into the movie, he are, he's already getting his rape on. <laughs> now we were talking, you said you haven't seen this movie in 30 years. You haven't. And that's, uh, you are such a bastard in this movie. <laughs> You're so bad. I think you got the first line in the movie, which is like, hey, bunny rabbit, where you going? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, first of all, David Hewitt is a guy who doesn't really get as much credit as he should for making these terrible films. Uh, the guys like Al Adamson or Ray Dennis Steckler, who also worked with, are kind of well-known uh, schlock movie directors. David Hewitt made, I think his worst movie is called The Wizard of Mars, which is just absolutely compelling. Uh, and it's John Carradine all right. in the sky, just saying all this gibberish for like 40 minutes. <laughs> now this movie is much more ambitious. Uh, what was your opinion of, of uh, director David Hewitt? Uh, Dave Hewitt was really a strange fellow. He, he worked his way into low budget movies as a special effects guy. And so he was always hanging around lighting things on fire. And then one day, actually, he was, uh, had just gotten out of prison, and none of us knew that. He said, here, we're done. And, and there was this big sound stage called Hollywood Sound Stage, and in that sound stage were little offices that were filled up with these low-budget film directors, film Al Adamson, a whole, a whole art names. And, uh, we made snakes for them. Yeah, snakes. So, uh, Dave Hewitt took an office and suddenly he was a director, didn't have a clue as to what directing was about. But he'd watched Al, who, who made a lot of movies, and uh, kind of, more or less, you know, sort of kind of what he was doing. Uh, Dave Hewitt uh, sort of copied Al and, and hired uh, people that had semi-names or were going up or going down. And on the uh, list, the A and the B and the Z and the D list, and uh, he was just a nice, but a very weird guy who, who didn't know what he was doing. So I think that shows. You see. <laughs> but he did kind of get these casts that are fascinating. Yes, now, if you look at it now, and it's got a, I, I know my favorite parts in the movie are the parts where you're in it, and you're being such, as I said, just such a bastard. And then the parts where with uh, Casey Kasem and Jack Starrett, the great director Jack Starrett, who's also a really, badass sheriff in this movie with a great Texas accent, uh, as he deserved because he's from Corpus Christi. But in this movie, I think that their, their scenes are just so funny that if David Hewitt had had a great sense, he would have given them more scenes probably because we're a great comedy team. Jack Starrett really was, and he was a good actor, and he went on to do uh, Rambo, First Blood, and uh, directed Cleopatra Jones. But unfortunately, Jack just looked in a, you know, eight ball of cocaine and that was it. He thought it was heaven. And he went from, you know, a bank account of six or seven million dollars to living in a garret, unfortunately. But he never did take on the persona of a jerk or anything. He was just the nicest person in the world, whether he was stoned or what. He just, we lost a very good guy much too soon. He's the sheriff in this, and he's always chewing gum. He's the one that's chewing gum. Juicy, juicy fruit gum, fruit. actually. And not only is he chewing it, uh, well, uh, he got me to buy it. He's, he's like the greatest spokesman for juicy fruit gum, because Casey Kasem's always like freaking out. He, sheriff, we gotta go get the moonshine still. And he's like, 
Man, I sure wish you'd have some juicy fruit gum. <laughs> a lot of this movie, it's set in the South, but mm -hmm. it was filmed in California. Right. Of course, and a lot of it was actually filmed on a movie ranch there called the Spawn Ranch. Spawn Ranch. Which is very famous for uh, some of the people who uh, lived on it. Charlie Manson and his creepy crawlies were living on the Spawn Ranch, and the Spawn Ranch was a place where a lot of people would do westerns because you could get horses cheap and all kinds of sagebrush and stuff around it, but also it was perfect for a moonshining picture. So we shot uh, this picture on the Spawn Ranch, and the production manager had a dune buggy that broke down, and he needed it fixed. And so we were, the creepy crawlies, all the girls used to come down and sit around on the rocks and beg our lunches from us. Whatever movie crew was there, they would, they would. And so we just thought they were these little flower children of some kind, but. Uh, we said, we need to get this dune buggy fixed. Anyone here know what the, and they said, yeah, we've got a great mechanic. And out came Charlie Manson. And he was about, if you know who Charlie Manson is, he was about this tall, and he had bare feet and a bare chest, and he looked like a shoplifter. He would never look at you. He would always be down like this and look up at you like this. And I can't imagine anyone following him Anyway, <laughs> he said he was a uh, expert mechanic and that he would fix the dune buggy, but he needed seventy dollars up front, which I gave him. Bud Cardos was production manager, and I, we gave him the money and came back the next morning and the dune buggy wasn't fixed. So I said, "Go get me Charlie," and Charlie came back over, you know, looking like this. And I said, "You need to get this. It isn't fixed." And he said, well, I've got to have something. I said, no, no, a deal's a deal, and you better fix it right away, because Bud Carlos is about the toughest guy in Hollywood, and he's going to give you a new anus if you don't get this fixed right. <laughs> Boy, he was under that hood like you wouldn't believe and had that, uh, that thing fixed. But every, I shot out on the ranch, probably shot seven or eight films there, and uh, all the time, one, one time I was telling Lars, we stopped on this film to eat lunch, and we were way out in the middle of the Thule's. And you'll see the car chases and things, and that's all the Spawn Ranch. And we stopped at this well to eat our lunches, and that was the well they had killed uh, a stunt guy named Shorty Shea and stuffed him down that well. And we didn't know we were sitting there eating our lunches, and all the time there was this corpus delecti down the well. Yeah, why, and, and he would have been there while you were eating While we were there, right, right. Because no one knew that Charlie had, he'd already done the murders, but no one knew it yet. Yeah, you're so close. By the way, this movie is always uh, listed as 1966, but in fact it is, uh, as you could tell with your eyes, you don't need us to tell you, 1968. Um, the good guy in this movie, actually, is uh, Jody McRae, who was uh, Joel McRae's son. And I would gather probably most people here don't know who Joel McRae is. Yes. Right. Yeah, if you see Sullivan's Travels, possibly you do. But, but he was a big star. He was kind of like the strong, silent type, kind of a, a little bit more vulnerable Gary Cooper uh, in movies. And people would have been expected when they see uh, Jody McRae in a movie at the time to say identify him with his dad, Joe McRae. So he doesn't bring a lot of energy to the part, but he would have been a walking billboard for all those great American values just by being identified with his dad, uh, right. Joe McRae. What did you estimate the budget on this film was? I would think maybe twenty-five, thirty thousand. Probably, probably. Yeah. Nine-day shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what you got paid? Probably something like fifty dollars a day, yeah. maybe thirty a day. And the and big peanut butter sandwiches for lunch. The big star on this movie, I guess, the biggest, the top listed star is probably Jody McRae. And how much would you imagine he got made, paid? Maybe a hundred a day or something like that. If that, yeah. seventy-five or a hundred. <laughs>